direct your Bible to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. I think I'll stay behind the podium so I don't need to put the time icon. I'm going to go off script a little bit. I cannot, I have a difficult time being real formal, so I just need to relax here. Uh, Brother Paul, you win the prize for the most visitors. And are they practicing social distancing with you or what? You know, they got you over there. And I think the number of chairs are taken out was the deal. Um, anyways, it's good to have uh, the Paul Johnson family. That's how I'm going to refer to you. Good to have you with us. Okay, I want to uh, begin by just reading something that uh, I prepared because I, I'm speaking to more people than who are in this congregation right now. So let me say this. I do respect our president and I pray for him often. I had no peace about canceling all of the services, though I have diligently prayed and thought about it. And I may next week. It was the president's recommendation, not his mandate, that we have no more than 10 in a group gathering. If it was martial law, I would have complied. I've actually heard and read reports about no more than 50 in a gathering. Either way, you should practice social distancing. That is a word that concerns me. Especially when I know that the easiest means of conquering a people is to divide a people. Yes, this is different. This concerns our physical well-being. With that, I would say, let's practice some common sense. I believe we need to avoid extreme behavior. We can't live in paranoia, nor can we live without hygienic precaution. And I trust people do that regardless, but especially at a time like this. Now, if we were set up to live stream the services last week, if we were set up to do this, I may have canceled the services. Please don't bludge your beer stone. Uh, but if we would have had this available, I may have. Don't know for sure. Either way, I believe we need to implement uh, that medium to minister the Word of God. If anything, uh, this outbreak has caused me to see and need, see the need of utilizing more of the social media services in our ministry. And for that, I am grateful, though I am uncomfortable. <laughs> Last night, I spent two hours trying to share this message that I'll, that I'll preach to you, and it will be different here in this setting. Uh, I was in front of my phone at my desk, and uh, wow, when you watch yourself on camera, you discover things about yourself that are not always comforting. <laughs> so to those church members who are listening online, I want you to know if we can help you in any way, please call, text, or email me. Our staff and some of our church members are more than willing to help if they can. We love you and we are praying for you. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Acts 27. The title is Enduring a Storm. Enduring a Storm. Last Sunday morning, I <coughs> had the privilege of going to church with our daughter and son-in-law. And uh, the preacher used this passage, used this text. And honestly, I thought that is, that's a fantastic text. I won't preach it the way he preached it. But I love the passage. And the passage deals with Paul's journey to Rome. He's on a ship. He's just left a city called Myra. And they're, they're heading to Rome. He's a prisoner. There are 276 people on this ship. There's the centurion and his soldiers. There's the captain of the ship. And there are a few other prisoners. Uh, <clears throat> Paul's purpose is to go to Rome and witness to Caesar. And so, we pick up this journey. I want us to look at, first of all, verse 10 and 11. We're going to bounce around. Verse 10, the Bible says, And serves, and said, Serves unto them. I'm sorry. And said unto them, Serves, I perceive that this voyage will be with current. And much damage. 
not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And so Paul gave a warning. Go to verse 14. But not long after, there arose against it, it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up in the wind, we let her drive. Let's jump down to verse 20. Verse 20, the Bible says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Verse 21, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we are thankful for your word, and we're thankful that uh, we have a, a lesson, a historical record of a man who endured a storm and how he helped others endure this storm. And I pray that you'd teach us this morning. I pray that you'd minister to each one here and uh, those who are watching and listening. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask, Lord, that uh, you would be glorified in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I want, I want us to notice a couple things about this, okay? Uh, in regards to enduring this storm, there are some things that were lost during the storm, and a storm can do that. A storm in your life, uh, let alone a country, uh, there's going to be some losses. But that's all right. The Bible talks about if we remove the dross from the silver, then it will come forth a vessel for the finer. And sometimes those losses really bring out the best. And so I want us to look at the scriptures. We're going to do a study here through this passage. And let's look at some of the things that these people lost that were on this ship as they were going through this storm. If you got your Bibles, look closely. First of all, verse 14 and 15, they lost freedom. It says, but not long after, there arose against it, that is the ship, a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. What they were saying was, we no longer had control. We no longer could control this ship. It was on its own. We were under the rule of a force greater than us. That's what he was saying. When the, we let her drive. Some of you men are probably thinking, yeah, I've been there. I might as well let her drive. <laughs> but we're talking about this storm here, okay? The whole ship was being tossed about it. And this, this Eurachlodon would, would be uh, similar to a hurricane in the Mediterranean Sea. I wouldn't uh, equate it quite to a typhoon. They certainly couldn't have made it out. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. God can deliver from anything. But the fact of the matter is, this was shaking their ship apart. And so they lost freedom. And right now in society, in our country, uh, there has been a restriction of, of some liberties. We understand that. And right now, fortunately, most of it is self-restraint that we're exercising. We're not taking advantage of many of the other liberties, such as handshaking the way we normally do. I, it's still habitual. If I shake your hand, don't be mad at me. Okay. It's just habitual. Just, uh, just remember when you were a kid. I don't know if they do this. When I was a little kid, they had this thing called cooties. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they talk about cooties now. But it's like everybody has cooties. And then what was that little saying? Something dot dot Operation Cootie Shot. Is that just where I came from? It was really stupid. The girls made it up. It wasn't the guys. <laughs> Anyways, we know that we have, uh, we've been placed under some restrictions, and it is understandable. 
And those restrictions seem like a loss of freedom. But why? Because as a country, we are uh, we're facing a little bit of a storm here. Uh, I don't pay attention. I don't watch the news all day. Maybe I need to pay attention more often to the news, but I don't. And so maybe that's why I'm not as, I, I don't, and maybe because it's not hit me firsthand. I've not experienced somebody who's actually had it. I've read about people, I know there are nurses in our church that tell us this is real, this is real. And I'm not making light of that at all. But the fact that I've been distanced from it, I, I don't feel overwhelmed yet. I, I hope I don't. But I, I do feel it affecting my freedom. Now, I will say this. I, I don't mind extra time off. It's relaxing. But as far as our economy goes, I know that this is not going to be helpful. And so, uh, first of all, we notice uh, some things that were lost, we see freedom. Next, look at verse 16. Peace. Peace was lost. Verse 16 says, and running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. That idea of much work there, that means they had more than what was necessary. There were things that they had to do that were out of the norm. Uh, we're doing that right now. We're doing some things. I have washed my hands till I've washed the suntan right off. <laughs> John, she sent me a text of, uh, I, I hate to even mention it, but I'm going to, of uh, the Terminator. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of his hands after the metallic part of himself is exposed and the flesh is removed. I, if you've never seen it, you don't need to watch it. But anyways, he says, this is the way I feel after washing my hands so much. But uh, I've probably washed my hands more over the past two weeks than I did all of last year. <laughs> it's incredible. I've even got a little handy dandy thing of soap here. <laughs> my wife says, this smells manly. <laughs> I don't need that pretty flavor stuff. <laughs> but anyways, <clears throat> the storm uh, brought a loss of freedom, brought a loss of peace. Look at verse 17. It brought a loss of stability. And I know you can incorporate both of those, but stability. Verse 17 says, Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, straight sail, and so were driven. Uh, those helps, what they did was they took ropes and they would tie, uh, these ropes would go underneath the ship and they would tighten them to keep the ship together because the boards were literally coming apart. Why? Because it had become so unstable. The storm was shaking this ship to the degree that the panelings on the boards were, uh, the boat were, were falling apart. And so there was a loss of stability. And I, in a sense, I can feel that just because I'm kind of out of my comfort zone here. But I think that's a reality. Uh, storms do that. Storms do that. They affect our peace. They affect our stability. Something else that's lost in here. This is just the intro, so hang in there. I'm going to speak fast. Possession. Look at verse 18 and verse 19. It says, and we, and we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Now here's the deal. They had come to a place where uh, the ship was hitting a sandbar. And yet, there were deep waters at uh, one end of the ship. And the result was, while one part of the ship is stuck, the other part is being shaken to pieces, they knew they had to get off the sandbar. And so they began unloading things. Everything that was not absolutely necessary even food, tools, possessions, they start unloading things so that they can lighten the ship and get off the sandbar. You need to be able to understand that as you're reading that. Because on that sandbar was the danger zone. 
And so they lost possessions as a result of this. And certainly, uh, there are employers, there are restaurant employers that could say, yes, I understand that. I'm losing possessions here. <clears throat> but then we come to verse 20, and this is the most severe loss of all. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They lost hope. Friend, I'm telling you, when you lose hope, that's when people become crazy. That's when people start hoarding unnecessarily. That's when people forget about the needs of those around them. And in some cases, that's when people even become suicidal when they lose hope. We're not there. And the beauty is this story's not over. And the beauty is I've read the whole chapter, and you probably have as well. There was hope found when it seemed there was none. <clears throat> One man gets up on that ship, and I'm sure that <clears throat> to most of the soldiers, and to the captain, when Paul got up and said, be of good cheer, I believe God. They may have at first thought, what has that guy been drinking? What's he been smoking? Is he some nut? No, not like even Peter had to say, hey, we're not drunk with wine as some men told, some men think, but we're filled with the Spirit. And Paul was a man at this time who would step up with a message of good cheer, with hope. And you can't Listen, you cannot dispense hope unless you have hope. you got to have hope in your heart if you're going to dispense hope. And so what I want us to do at this time as we get ready to zero in on the last lap of this message here is I want us to see what it was that gave Paul this hope. Why could he say, hey, be of good cheer? What prompted that? He wasn't acting, and he wasn't listening. We know he wasn't offering a false hope. There are false hopes out there. He was offering a real hope. So let's look at this in detail in these scriptures here. In verse 21, first of all, I want to say it says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sir, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. It's kind of like he's saying, I told you so. I don't know if you've ever had anybody tell you that. It's a blessing. I, I'm, I'd rather be the guy that says I told you so than have other people tell me I told you so. But, you know, like a parent would say to their child, I told you so, or a coach, or an employer, or even a friend for that matter. Paul is saying, I told you so. See, their mistake was not listening to him in the first place. And I want to say this uh, to make it even a little more practical. This problem that the people on this boat are experiencing for them it was a it was unnecessary now troubles come to our lives for numerous reasons sometimes they come because they're self-inflicted how many of you have ever brought trouble in your life because of your bad decisions two of you all right i know i have i know i have other times we can uh, we can experience trouble because of the people we're with. Sometimes it, it could be a friend, it could be even a parent. We experience trouble because of the people we're with. In Paul's case, that was the deal. The centurion and the captain disregarded the word of God. But there are other occasions where trouble comes just because it's ordained of God. All we have to do is read the book of Job to discover that. So regardless of why the trouble's there, the idea is, okay, you can't live without hope. And we find Paul shouting out a message of hope in a difficult situation. And so what is this hope founded on here, okay? That's what I want to look at. First of all, Oh, well, let me, oh, I shouldn't say first of all, but his 
hope was not founded on his circumstances. Can we agree with that? He didn't say be of good cheer because isn't it a nice sunny day and don't we have a nice cruise? That was not the reason. It wasn't because of the crowd he was hanging with. Later on in this chapter, we'll find out that some of these men would have executed Paul real quickly. When the ship did come apart, they mentioned to the captain, should we kill the prisoners? They had no problem stuffing the life out of Paul. So it wasn't the crowd. It wasn't, the, it wasn't like Paul was around a bunch of people that were fat on the back there to encourage him. He was a prisoner. So his hope wasn't found in his circumstances. It wasn't found in the crowd. It wasn't found in his health. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I have a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know all the details other than this. He had some type of physical ailment that was very uncomfortable. Some of you have that right now. Maybe your back, your, maybe your head, whatnot. Um, but he had a physical ailment he had to live with. It was very, very uncomfortable. It was a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed that God removed it, and God didn't remove it. But God did give him grace. There's a blessing walking close to God. You get near the grace ATM machine. <laughs> and so we know that if, if it wasn't founded on those things, what was it founded on? Well, I got to say this if it wasn't founded on those things, well, praise the Lord because some of us can relate. Because it's not like my health is giving me good cheer, and it's not like the crowd's giving me good cheer, and it's not like the circumstances are giving me good cheer. So, where? Where's it found? Well, let's look real close. Number one here, verse 22. Uh, he says, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. He knew who had spoken to him. It wasn't an enemy. It wasn't a stranger. No, it was his heavenly Father, God Almighty, who had a message for Paul. God, I mean, Paul knew God was speaking to him. And when you know God is speaking to you, friend, I tell you, you can find some encouragement. And it, when it gets most dangerous is when God is not speaking at all. It is important that you and I be good listeners. Jesus said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith." As a child of God, the Father wants to talk to you. He talks to you through his word. Now, don't be like the crazy guy who was struggling and needed a word from the Lord and said, I'm going to just, Lord, speak to me and wherever I put my finger in the Bible, that's, I'm going to trust that's what you have for me. So he opened his Bible and he, he put his finger on the passage in Matthew and Judas went and hung himself. He said, oh, that can't be it. I'm going to try it one more time. Lord, speak to me through the Bible. He opened it again, put his finger down, and it, the passage he read was, Go bow and do likewise. <laughs> that is not the way to read the Bible, okay? If you, want to, if you want to read the Bible, get some comfort. I tell you, and if you're not familiar with it, read through the Psalms. Begin at Psalms 1 and just keep on plowing. And if this coronavirus thing is still going on by the time you get to Psalms 150, jump into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if it's still going on by the time you're done with that, why not check out Romans and 1st, 2nd Corinthians. And if it's still going on when you're done with that, just finish the New Testament. And if it's still going on when you're done with that, just go on into Genesis and work your way back. I'm telling you, God's going to have a message for you if you're paying attention. Amen. You'll know when God speaks to you. You know the blessing? There are some voices that are distinctive. As in, I think every child, every child is able to discern their parent's voice out of the crowd. I know, at least I know for me. I remember as a, a young peewee baseball player. <laughs> it didn't matter if I was on the ball diamond, basketball court, football field, or in the backyard with a group of friends. If I heard my dad say, Merv! I can hear his voice through it all. And it doesn't matter how loud the storm is, God has a word for you. That's right. That's right. And he can speak to you if you're listening. Right. 
Paul knew who had spoken to him. He could be of good cheer because he knew. He could share the message of hope because he knew who had spoken to him. God, God did. Number two, he knew who owned him. Look at verse 23. Verse 23, it says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am. That's beautiful. He was saying, I know whose property I am. I'm under. I know who owns me. Matter of fact, he knew the price that was paid for his purchase. Hey, if anybody's struggling with that low self-esteem, hey, you need to remind yourself that God paid the ultimate price to bring you back to him. That's right, that's right. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed so that you could be redeemed, you could be reconciled, you could have a relationship with the Lord. When God came walking through the Garden of Eden looking for Adam and Eve, Adam, where are thou? It's not like he didn't know. But sin had separated them. But God wanted fellowship. Amen. And God had to make means, make provision to, to restore that fellowship. And that's exactly what he did through Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross, being buried and rising again. Amen. So that you and I could have fellowship with the Lord God Almighty. Amen. You need to know you've been purchased, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You know, when you spend a lot of money on something, <clears throat> it becomes important to you. My son-in-law bought a 20-foot Key West boat. It's, it's a nice little cruise boat, and fishing boat. He paid cash for it. I'm proud of him. But he and my daughter are real particular about that thing. I got in there and didn't think anything of it. And I'm walking, walking around and he says, uh, hey, can you take your shoes off? <laughs> I said, well, I suppose. And I did look back and see the mud marks so I walked. And <clears throat> I think, I'm going fishing and you want me to take my shoes off. I'll be watching you closely what you do with the hooks. <laughs> no, then uh, later on, uh, Brown and Dawn joined us because we went out early. They joined us and Brown says, boy, this is dirty. And she was really disappointed at me for not having it planned. Why were they getting upset? Because they, they, they invested in it. What a look nice. I'm telling you, God cares about you. He cares about you intimately. Paul knew who owned him. Who's I am? That's a blessing. Because nobody, listen, you're in the Father's hand. You're in Jesus' hand. He's in the Father's hand. And no man can pluck you out of his hand. You've been walking with Christ. I move on here. Verse 23. He said, Whose I am and whom I serve. Amen. Y'all get that? You see, Paul not only knew who had spoken to him, he not only knew whose he was, but he also knew who he served. Oh, he was a master, but he wasn't a taskmaster. You know, it's a wonderful thing because who you serve will determine the supplies you get. In Genesis 24, when Abraham sent his servant out to get a bride for Isaac, guess what? That servant had all the supplies of Abraham that he needed to win this bride over. God Almighty has given you and I all that we need to give him glory, to serve him. Now realize, listen, you say, well, I got physical limitations. You have exactly what God wants you to have at this point in your life. That's, right. That's all right. God's not expecting you to do what somebody else. Uh, he's not expecting someone who is struggling with, uh, with back pain and, and maybe some uh, arthritic pain to do the heavy lifting. But he has given you grace to have a good attitude. It's available, I'll say it like that. It's available. So who, he knew who he, served, who he was serving. And then I move on here. In verse 24, verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So what we discovered, we read about what was lost, now we read about what was found, and that was hope, and we're, we're discussing how this hope was found. 
It was found because Paul knew who had spoken to him. He knew who owned him. He knew who he was serving, and he knew where he was going. Amen. God had promised Paul, I'm going to get you safely ashore. Not just you, but everybody that's with you. You know, that's important. Who we fellowship with is very important. That's right, that's right. But the reality is this. As believers, this world is not our home. Right. You're all mindful of that. It's important that you're mindful of that. Be careful about putting too many of your investments in this world. Because we're not taking it with us. That's right. That's right. Only what we've done for the Lord Jesus Christ do we get to look forward to when we get to glory. Mm -hmm. Paul knew he was going to make it. He knew he was to meet Caesar, which sounds a little formidable. But there's another reality, another application I want to give you. You and I are going to get through this one way or the other. Right. We're going to get to the other side. And that's a blessing when you know that. Next, verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe in God. That it shall be even as it was told me. So he knew where he was going. And in summary, verse 25, in summary, he said, I believe God. I trust everything he has told me. Well, why shouldn't he? Uh, he was left for dead outside of the city of Lystra after being stoned to death, and God raised him up. He was in a Philippian jail in the innermost dungeon after being beaten nearly to death. And God shook that jail loose, and God used that event in Paul's life to get the gospel to not just the prisoners, but the jailers. And they would press on from there because God wasn't done with them. And let me tell you, in the will of God, as long as you're looking to serve your master, you're in the safest place you'll ever be. That's right. And you can believe it. Now, some of you might be like I was when I first went ice fishing. When I first went ice fishing, I went with a man named Ed Weber. And uh, <clears throat> my mother was dating him. And He'd take me out to Long Lake in northern Michigan. I don't know if I was, I might have been about 10 years old, 10 or 11. I had enough sense to know that if you go through the ice, uh, you may not come back up, especially when you're going in that, the deep water. I've never walked out on the ice like that. He had this little building out there that we call a shanty. And he said, we're going to walk out there. It was in the middle of the lake. And he walked out like this is no lake. He was on the sidewalk. So I kind of followed him behind him with trepidation. And we finally got into that shanty, and he turned on a little heater. Sure enough, there was a little hole in the ice, and he had to clean it out again. He said, you want some marshmallows? Sure, he would roast some marshmallows in this little stove he had. And then he had hot chocolate. And then we had a regular picnic inside that thing. <laughs> he had these little bitty fishing poles. And started catching fish. And I'm telling you, within about 15, 20 minutes of that experience, I forgot all about the ice. And when it was finally time to leave, he had a springer to fish with him. And we walked back to the truck, which seemed like about a quarter mile walk across that lake. I, I, I forgot all about it. But I'll tell you, that walk out there, my heart was anxious. But after experiencing it with someone who's been there, man, my, my faith thermometer was up high. I had, I had confidence in the ice. Now I realize there's some I shouldn't walk out. But I believe a lot of people, a lot of people that are just now starting to live for the Lord, it's hard for them to trust, even with the area of tithing or witnessing. Right. And they, they do it with fear and trepidation. But what you're going to discover is if you'll let the Lord take your hand, if you'll take his hand, he'll take you through these storms all the way through. Amen. And you'll look back and say, you know, that wasn't so bad after all. 
The day would come in Paul's life when he would tell Timothy, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which has been committed unto me until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, you're in good hands with the Lord Jesus. Amen. I know every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we love you. We pray that you bless the service and minister to hearts. Our heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe this morning you'd say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart. And I just ask for prayer. And so with an uplifted light hand, you just uh, testify that you have some prayer requests. I, I'd be more than happy to pray for you. Anybody like that? Okay. God bless you. God bless you. This can be a great opportunity as well for us to be a witness for Christ. Let's take advantage of that. I'm not saying we get out and go door to door. I know that we are limited in that aspect. But we're still going to come in contact with people. So let's show some Christian poise. Father, help those that raise their hands and encourage their heart. And if there are any that have not received the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior, I pray they'd make that decision. Immediately, they'd place themselves in your hands. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll sing a song.